so I, I, uh, I'm sitting at home one day in Prescott, Arizona, got a, a not one-year-old son, got a three-year-old son and a 26-year-old wife. The phone rings and just as it rings, my three-year-old spills M&Ms or Skittles all over the floor. I'm frustrated, I just, but the phone's ringing. This is before answering machines, before voicemail. I grab the phone up there and say, hello. We had gotten a demo tape, right, as would happen. And we got um, a resume, which by the way, I saved. I texted your dad a copy of the resume. It's like, hey, look at this. And I've got the tape, I've got the demo tape, I can't find it. So the group, and I chaired the, uh, uh, the committee, and the group liked what they saw and what they heard. So I make the call, and you know, it's all true. I mean, the story's all true. And a voice I've never heard before says, hello, is this the Reverend Wiegand? And I, not knowing who the voice was before caller ID, just thought it was one of my buddies giving me a hard time. So I said, yes, this is the Reverend Wiegand. How may I bless you, my child? I hear this voice go, uh, well, my name's John Yinger. And I thought, oh, it's a telemarketer. I said, well, hey, Yinger, how's it going, buddy? So yeah, he did that, you know, hey, Yinger. Well, you know, and, you know, and it was funny. And, uh, but it, of course, obviously didn't hurt anything. In fact, it might have uh, moved him up a couple notches because again, very real, uh, very personable, um, very funny, and I appreciate that stuff. Maybe if one of the other guys had called and, you know, hey, what, you know, maybe it would have been different. But, uh, you know, it didn't bother me, it was great. And then I realize what's been happening for the last 30 seconds is a life-changing moment where I'm being invited to be introduced to a congregation in Fenton, Michigan, to be interviewed as its senior pastor. And that's how the story began. Arizona, a place that I loved, to um, Michigan was a total, it was a real adjustment. We were coming home to my husband's hometown, home state, and to a place I had never been. And I mean, the first year was so hard. And I just remember thinking, why couldn't we have moved closer to my family? Why couldn't we have moved to Idaho? Why couldn't, you know, because I, that's where I wanted to be. And I thought Michigan people were just crazy, if you want the truth. I remember my first impressions were these are, these are kind, kind, almost like country folk, almost like people that they were a little out of place in the day and age in which we were living. They, 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 were, they were potluck, uh, not buffet, not you know $25 steaks, they were, they were potluck. They, they were this wonderful conglomeration of people with different giftings and talents, and we got to know them. We made a commitment that we would not think about leaving, we would not think about quitting for 24 months. Little did we know that within the next six weeks, we'd be counting <laughs> those months down and uh, had a very, very trying season. It was just really hard to be here without um, people. My, my in-laws actually moved here for the summer that year to help us with the boys and everything. They, we lived in the church. So we had a time frame between when we had to be out of an apartment that we lived in and into the home we were buying and we didn't have anywhere to go. So us and the two boys moved into the church and my in-laws moved into the church as well. They slept on an air mattress in a room and they would get up and take the boys all day and so we could do stuff here. You've got such a beautiful, strong, pioneering leader in F. E. Burke, the founding pastor of the church who's 70. You've got all this new innovation and new ideas and a kid that's 29. And, and, and now those who were at that church because the leadership and the Pentecost and the, you know what I mean? That's, that's where they were. Now I come in and we'd start changing things. And it was very difficult to watch people that no longer, no longer connected to the ministry begin to leave. It was a Teutonic shift. It was a change in outreach and uh, a change in strategy, but not a change in message. I mean, there was never, um, any concern that the message was being compromised or you know the gospel was going forward that was all cool but how we did it um, capitalizing on this great location back when the fireworks were done at the high school um, we he basically saw um, good assets underutilized the founder used to say change or die 
<laughs> so change or die. And uh, we didn't die. So I was 15 in 1995 and my dad and I were um, uh, the groundskeepers. My dad was of the, the church. And I remember when Pastor Jim and Dina Wiegand came and the church voted them in. Um, I remember there was this energy, this sense of hope, this sense of, hey, we're going to go somewhere. I, I, I think the leaders and the board and the pastor of Fenton Assembly of God at the time knew we needed change. And um, they believed and we believed. My family believed that Pastor Jim and Dina Weekend were the ones to bring that change. And so I think we were excited about um, the weekends, we were excited. I mean, one, they were a young family. I think, I think Pastor Jim was 29 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that excited us families and young families. And because we were groundskeepers, I think it gave us the opportunity to get to know his heart maybe quicker or faster than, than others to some degree. Um, but I, I do believe that the church overall was um, excited about the change and ready just to move forward and be a part of, you know, a mission that was going to change lives. Uh, so there I was on the, <laughs> on the marriage retreat, smoking behind the hotel and Pastor Jim and Dina come slowly walking up. Literally, I had a cigar. I was trying to quit smoking cigarettes. So I had a cigar because that's what you do. I don't know. That's what I did. And so I had a cigar and I'm out in the back of the hotel and me and Melanie are out there. I don't remember if she was smoking, but I know Ralph was. My brother Ralph, I mean my dad Ralph, yeah, he was there smoking too. And Pastor Jim and Dina come walking down the sidewalk and I'm looking down the, and I see it's them. So I cut the cigar gently behind my back like, oh man. And it was just, there was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. You should be a pastor. <laughs> I came from a very small church and so my friends all came to Freedom Center. It was Fenton Assembly of God at the time. And, you know, it was, he, I actually remember the first message that um, Pastor Jim spoke. And uh, all of my friends were like, you should, we should go meet him. Like, we should go talk to him, you know, the pastor of this large church. <laughs> and, you know, that being, having a pastor that was approachable was kind of foreign to me, but it was like, ah, what the heck, you know? So I went up and talked to him. He was the most down to earth person I've ever met in my life. Um, Dina, I, <laughs> I was just intimidated by you. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what else to really uh, say there with that. I, I don't think, you know, really until um, dating Faye and then marrying Faye, you know, I had the opportunity to get to know Dina a little bit more and, you know, just what a gem uh, she is, but uh, both of them, really. We understand that there has been a Our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. One of the most difficult things uh, that we ever had to serve this community through was 9-11. Um, kind of like not that long ago, things were good. You're plugging along, things are growing, things are healthy, things are predictable. And then we were on a staff retreat out at a, a campground. While we were walking, I kept getting phone calls. Um, it was Dave, I could hear it was Dave. I couldn't really hear what he was saying. Um, and then all of a sudden I just get, the church wants you home right now. And I'm like, I don't even know what's happening. What? And I, I was thinking, well, they want us home because they're upset that we're gone. Like it was the first time that we had ever gone and taken the staff to do something. And I just thought somebody found out, they're upset about it. And um, so I was trying to find my husband to tell him. And when I did, he came up to me and he just had this look on his face. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, I'm really not sure, but we need to find um, some new station. I was walking by this guy's RV and he had one of these little like, dinky battery powered TV sets with an antenna on it. And that was where I heard that, that uh, two planes had flown into the World Trade Centers and that our nation was under attack. I'd like to say my immediate response was mercy and forgiveness, but it wasn't. My first response was to attempt to, to re-enlist in the military. I was gonna see justice done. Um, our nation was in a tough time. It, it, you didn't know who to trust. You didn't know if there were victims buried. You didn't know if the military had under control. You didn't know if the president knew what he was talking about. Um, there were numbers and statistics and people started pointing fingers and blaming so quickly. It was, it was really despicable. 
And, um, but the one thing that really stands out, I remember we got back, it was on a Monday that the planes hit. We got back, we went to the church to pray. And by the time we got here, cars were lined up in the parking lot. People I'd never met. Waitresses that worked at the, the Coney Island around the corner, teachers from across the street. They, they didn't know what to do but to turn to God. And they did. And we unlocked the doors, and the doors of this church stayed unlocked for the next seven days, day and night. The lights were on. We told everybody, it's before social media, but we just let everybody know the church is unlocked. And if you need a place to pray, we turn music on and people would just find a place to just to kneel and pray. And they did. By the hundreds, people came to this church and they found a quiet place. They, they cried a few tears. Um, they talked to God and they left having some sense of hope or resolution. In 2001, 9-11, uh, created a, a, a tremendous scare for obvious reasons. And um, I remember Pastor Jim leading through that. And um, I know for in my lifetime, that was it was it was something I had never experienced before. You know, I was 21. I was essentially kind of a part time staffer intern slash do everything else that nobody else wanted to do. And um, I remember it was very, there was just a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of anger, um, similar to some degree of what everyone's going through right now. And um, I felt like Pastor Jim led well through that season and called us to a place, you know, of, of trust, of action, um, of love and um, I think it really speaks to the character of of Dina and Pastor um, when leaders can one just be vulnerable and open and honest about I don't really know what's next but I do know that Jesus is still and I think Pastor Jim says that often that Jesus is still on the throne and um, that he's worth trusting and he's worth believing in and I think that was the, the the voice that calmed everyone's heart in the middle of the storm. That's what we did as a church, as a community, and as a nation, we turned to God. And I wish I could say, and it lasted to this day. The truth is it lasted about three weeks when life went back to normal. Church attendance went back to normal. People's prayer life went back to normal. Uh, we made it through. Um, but I don't know that we learned everything we were supposed to learn. I think, I think there were things in that season that would have helped us a lot in this season if, if we'd have held up. The signs were everywhere, but now it's official we are in a recession. Nearly two million jobs have been now lost. And on Friday, we're likely to learn that we lost more jobs last year than at any time since World War II. Uh, 2008, we started to kind of hear rumblings that the, the economy uh, was in trouble, banks were in trouble, the housing market was in trouble, and being in Southeast Michigan and our economy based in manufacturing, manufacturing is the first thing to be cut off. It's the last thing to be turned back on again. So we went into recession long before the rest of the nation did. Some of the, the nation didn't even go through a recession, really. Alaska, North Carolina, and parts of Texas had no downturn during that time, but we were devastated. The values of our homes were cut in half. I, I paid uh, every month a mortgage payment for 11 years. And at the end of those 11 years of making faithfully those mortgage payments, my house was now worth half of what I owed on it after making payments 11 out of years out of a 30 year mortgage. Um, one out of seven homes in our community was vacant, but they were abandoned. People had no jobs, they had to leave. Um, and, and I think the hardest thing for me as a pastor was there was 40 consecutive weeks without interruption, without a break, where one or, or more families came with tears and said, this is our last Sunday have to go somewhere else. There's no work here, there's no money here, there's no help here, we have to leave. And I watched as my friends lost their homes, some of them lost their wives, some of them lost their children, some of them lost their sanity, because the world that we were in had suddenly been erased. And now we were faced, not with a 9-11 temporary three-week issue, but now this 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 unending. There, there was nobody that said, but in three weeks it'll be okay, in six months, but in one year, we had no idea how long a recession would last, and it lasted from 2008 through 2014. All of a sudden, I started becoming like, hey, the Titanic's going down, let's get out of town. You know, let's pack up all of our stuff, we can move, we can get out, you know, because I was concerned about us and our family, and 
My husband was concerned about the church and being here for the people and everything. And, um, but it started getting scary because people are losing their homes. People are losing their jobs. People are just, um, they're scared. They're looking for food to feed their kids. They're looking for just finances to pay for their mortgages. And I'm like, we can't possibly meet everybody. It just became where you felt like people were looking at you like you were God, you know? And when I say that, I mean like the church, you know, we need the church to do this. We need the church to do that. And it was just like, we were barely hanging on. I mean, we were all taking cuts in pay. We were all working second jobs, whatever we could find. And, um, but yet there was still something in me that I remember one day, um, we had women's ministry meeting and it was all my women's ministry leaders. And I said, we're going to go pray. We ended up back in the industrial park of Fenton and so many businesses were, they were closed down. They had weeds growing up everywhere for sell signs in front of them. And my heart just broke because I'm like, you know, one of our families has a business back there. And I was just like, no, you know, it just kind of was like this business and this business and this, and it was just crawling closer and closer to one of the families in the church. And I was like, no. So we just started praying and we were just praying that God use these businesses for people that are going to prosper, for people that are going to bring businesses to Fenton, people that are going to bring jobs, people that are going to bring just resources here. And, you know, sometimes you're like, you want to plant a seed and see it sprout the very next day and everything. And I mean, women were declaring things over those businesses. They were just speaking truth over those buildings, which we didn't know anything about what even was there. And um, it was just a really cool time of praying over those businesses. And so what we learned in that season was the, the crises as you ease into it, Sometimes you don't just bounce back out. Sometimes it takes a lot to wander through that wilderness for a long time. But I, I would say this too, that those were some of the greatest years of ministry. Even though people were leaving by the hundreds, people were coming in by the multiple hundreds. The church continued to grow. We planted uh, two churches and sent a third congregation to Georgia. We built a building during that season. Um, part of the reason was to keep our people working. We wanted people that had trades that had to move somewhere else. Like, we're gonna do an expansion right now. So we expanded the building to keep our people working. Money was flowing out faster than it was flowing in, but somehow the miracle after the miracle after the miracle, not living from offering to offering, but from miracle to miracle, we made it through that season. And because of what we, what we received, I mean, we had to give, but what we received in that season was a faith that can't be shaken by um, the economy. It can't be shaken by circumstance. It can't be shaken by what my home is worth, what my bills are due. We received during that season something that we carry with us to this day, and that's the firm confidence in God as provider. And I think that's one of the reasons our church has a culture of generosity today is because we gave when we didn't have anything to give. And now that we do have something to give, it's just a, a greater joy now to continue to, to, to be that church that's in that place at that time to help people in need. The number of those COVID-19 cases soaring here in the U.S., the shock waves to the economy, the stock market, All right, the losing eight trillion, trillion dollars in value in the last 6 month. 6.6 million mm -hmm. Americans filed for unemployment last week. That's on top of the 3.3 million who filed the week before. To preserve the health of our citizens, we must also preserve the health and functioning of our economy. I think this is probably the proudest I've ever been to be a part of this church. Um, you know, I, I think as a pastor, sometimes you wonder if we, if all of this gets taken away, are we playing church? You know, is the, you know, we're sitting in a nice room and, you know, the main auditorium right down there. And if people couldn't go to that anymore or do that or give to that or be a part of that, you know, would all of this just fade away? And I think, you know, and I'll speak to Dina specifically, you know, one of the things that <clears throat> I think has been the the standard across the board is there's just no bad idea. Like if there's a person to minister to, we're going to try to minister to them. And it's been truck drivers and grocery store workers and, you know, nurses and doctors and janitors and, you know, uh, uh, 
garbage truck, you know, I gave a gift bag to garbage truck, you know, men and, you know, it's, it's been, it's been everyone. It's been business owners. It's been, you know, I, I don't think there's a, a, a demographic that this church has not attempted to minister to. The COVID crisis really, really opened up some doors and opportunities for us to go and just be his hands and feet in our community. We've done, I can't even imagine that the masks that we've made and the letters that have been written and the money that's been invested into buying lunches specifically from different restaurants in our community to make sure that they stay on their feet. Like it is only because of their leadership, honestly and their, their leadership and their leading from the Holy Spirit and being obedient, that we're able to do that. The reason I have hope now is because, not because I'm an optimist, the reason I have hope now is because I went through the recession. The reason that I have faith now that, that I can touch an ATM and not die uh, is because I, I lived through 9-11. When we allow God to lead us through the stages of our life, it's interesting how, how those two old men in the nursing home telling the woman on 9-11 it's gonna be okay. It's, it's, I'm kind of the old guy now telling a generation, if you will trust the Lord, if you will you know, turn from, from wickedness, if it's anywhere in your heart, if you will seek his face, I can promise you that his hands are not far behind his face. I know his faithfulness because he's been faithful. I know his strength because he's, he's shown himself strong. And I believe that this current crisis, as hard as it is, as unending as it seems, it's, it's just another step towards heaven. It's another thing that we will need for the things that are ahead. This is not the last crisis. This is not the last trying time. This is not the final test of a church. It's just another step towards eternity. And as we turn to the one who got us through all the, the World War IIs and the World War Ones and the Spanish flus and the Y2Ks and the 9-11s and the, you know, the COVID-19s, we'll find the same thing that those generations found. God is faithful and you can trust him. Um, both of you, um, Pastor Jim, you and Dina, have, have done so many things in the background and behind the scenes that I know about that no one else will know about. Conversations that we have had that no one else will know that we had. Things that you continue to believe in people when a lot of people chose not to believe in people. And so I just want to honor you for that. And I want to call out that truth that is in you. Um, that maybe m many hyper-spiritual people saw as a weakness. Um, people that knew you saw it as strength, and I see it as strength. And I'm grateful for your leadership, grateful for your love and friendship, grateful for your generosity. Yeah, I'm just high-fiving you. Way to go, 25, I think that's what it is. Oh, blacked out my screen. And um, I'm just grateful for your life. So thank you. Um, from someone who sees all the behind the scenes works and can uh, and and can appreciate, um, I didn't have the same appreciation that I do now. Now leading a church, it's a very different place, you know. So, way to go, Idaho! <laughs> One, two, three. Happy twenty fifth anniversary! <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that was awkward and hilarious. <laughs> Tyler forgot the word. <laughs> <laughs> All right, three words. <laughs> Happy 25th anniversary. <laughs> all right, that's all you got. <laughs> so happy anniversary, Pastor Jim and Dina. We're so glad you're here. We uh, are looking forward to more conquests and uh, turning this area upside down for the gospel. Yeah, I, uh, I, I haven't been around for all 25, um, but the 14, 15 of which I have been around has been um, the greatest 14, 15 years of my life. This place, uh, this small town <laughs> has become home in large part because of you guys' leadership and what you've allowed the Lord to do um, in and through you not just in this body, but in this entire city. So happy 25th, um, here's to the next 25. Uh, I'm, I'm right along with you guys in it, um, our family is, and, and we're looking forward to helping um, however God wants you to do in this place. Uh, we're right there beside you helping do it. Yeah, so from me and Melanie and my family, I just wanna say 
Pastor Jim and Dina, happy 25th anniversary. We love you guys. We, we cherish your friendship and uh, you guys are family to us. So thank you for all the sacrifices you've made and all the investments you've made. You guys are easy leaders to follow and we love you a lot. Uh, seeing everything that you two have done in the past 25 years for Freedom Center Church and just seeing how far it's come, it's just, it's such an honor to be serving with you guys and I'm just so excited to see what the future has. Just say a quick thank you just in case he doesn't use all of that. Oh, thank you. We love you guys so much. I don't know what's going <laughs> Future parents, thank you so much for all you've done for me and every everyone at Freedom Center Church. Um, I'm really excited for your future. Um, you guys are just a big blessing to everyone here. Thank you so much for the last 25 years of all the faithful service that you've had and everything that you've done, like having to raise me in the middle of it. So here's to the next 11 years of whatever ministry has to bring you. Hey, Pastor Jim and Dina, happy 25th anniversary. We love you and we thank you for everything you're doing here. Hey, Pastor Jim and Dina, just wanted to say happy 25th anniversary and just congratulations with just all the milestones that you guys have achieved. And we're just so blessed to have you guys here at Freedom Center Church. We love you. Hi, Pastor Jim and Dina, happy 25th anniversary. We love you guys. Thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Hey, Pastor Jim and Dina, thank you for all that you do um, for this church. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you for serving God so faithfully, and I can't wait to see what God has for you in your future. Hey, Pastor Jim and Dina, I love you so much. It's been such an awesome ride with you guys and learning so much from you guys. I hope that you guys have an amazing time here at Freedom Center, wherever God takes you. Thank you for your awesome 25 years. All right, hey, Pastor Jim and Dina. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for everything that you're doing and uh, happy 25 years of being at this church. And uh, I just want to say I like eating Chinese food with you guys. As I look towards the next 25 years, the thing that's on my heart even now is not how am I or where am I or when am I. What's on my heart is, is that passing of the baton to another generation. It's, it's not this year, it's not next year. It's not, I mean, but 10 years from now, I'm, I'm 65. 15 years from now, I'm 70, and Dina will be 29 yet again. Um, I think about as I look at this young generation, uh, the generation of my sons, the generation of those who we call our sons and our daughters, you know, they've been around forever. I watch them um, preparing to, to kind of pick up speed so that an older, tired guy can hand the baton and they can keep running. I think that the greatest day of my life, the greatest day of, if you will, my ministry life, or career is the wrong word, but I think you understand my tenure of serving this congregation, is, is not the, the greatest attended Sunday, or the greatest outreach event ever, or the greatest offering we've ever received, or the greatest gift we ever got to give away. I think the greatest moment of, of my life will be when I hand the keys of a debt-free building, uh, of a thriving ministry to the next generation. and drive out of the parking lot for the last time as the senior pastor of Freedom Center Church, knowing that it's in the right hands, it's heading in the right direction, it has the right heart. And then I get to go rest. I get to buy my snapper lawnmower and do my Forrest Gump imitation, mowing the grass, planting the flowers, and, uh, and I get to enjoy watching them run their lap for as long as I get to enjoy it. And then I get to go home, then I get to rest and I get peace for eternity. Then I get a crown that's placed on my head for the sole purpose of me being able to lay it at Jesus' feet and say thank you.